Oh, no, wait a minute. We don't have to figure out how to get the crew off the sub. He's already done that. He would have had to. All we have to do is figure out what he's going to do. So how is he going to get the crew off the sub? They'd have to want to get off. How do you get a crew to want to get off a submarine? How do you get a crew to want to get off a nuclear sub? <laughs> so funny. Well, the captain seems to think you're some sort of cowboy. New Paroski. Nimnoga. Mi pravdali? It is. I doubt you'd remember, but we met once at the consulate in Leningrad. Along with your wife. I'm very sorry. What gives you the right to fire on my ship? Your signal said nothing of a torpedo. Ryan. It was necessary to maintain the illusion for your crew. My crew are being rescued, yes? As we speak. You sent the signal. That's correct, sir. Then how did you know our reactor accident was false? Well, that was a guess, but it seemed logical. Very well. I present you the ballistic missile submarine Red October. My officers and I request asylum in the United States of America. It's a pleasure, sir. Bart Mancuso, USS Dallas. <laughs> Torpedo! The Americans are shooting at us again! Pitch is too high. The torpedoes rush. Welcome to the broadcast, and I wanted to actually get in um, Susie Dent and have a conversation, and it's probably a difficult conversation for a lot of people. Now, um, I'll introduce Susie, and she can she can do a talk and go through it. Um, but I would like to have a discussion with you, Susie, afterwards, and we'll we'll talk about some questions and some some of the tough issues that you've probably got before, um, and then we're looking at getting some questions from the students and people on social media after that there too. Okay, so I'll hand over to Susie. I'll introduce you to Susie Dent. Welcome, Susie. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks, Brad. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so pleased to be here. I'm going to talk to you tonight um, about, I've written this speech, right, so this is the first time I'm talking to anybody about it, so I'm kind of going to read it. I don't know it off by heart, and it took me a long time to figure out what I wanted to say about my journey um, involving the Me Too movement. So here we go. I like to call it um, kind is not a four-letter word. Our lives are all about choices. From the moment we wake, when we choose whether to hop straight out of bed or reach for the remote, we choose what we're going to do and where based on our activity of the day. We also choose how we feel about ourselves and other people. We're quick to choose and make snap decisions that we're mostly unaware of as it's part of our day to day. Let's say you've got a hard choice to make, one that could impact your life significantly. It's a will I or won't I situation, one that involves you coming forward to give important information to authorities about an unpleasant experience you had in support of a total stranger. Every time you think you've settled on what to do, the other choice tugs you back and you're back to where you started. It's a draw. Should you make a pro and con list, seek advice from friends and family, post in a chat room, or should you trust your gut? Our lives are created by our thoughts our words and our actions. We worry about the consequences of our actions and how they will affect us. We fear how our choices will be received. 
We fear judgment from others and sometimes that is enough to make our decision for us. So we tend to stay in our lane and not get involved. We base many of our opinions on issues from what we read online or absorb via media stories where we find judgment and negativity which often taps into our anger leading to self-righteousness. There is a growing trend in the addictive world of social media to say whatever you think, regardless of how it makes others feel, showing a distinct lack of compassion and kindness. Picture this. You're in a beautiful park with lots of green grass at a children's playground, sitting by yourself on one of the three benches that are shaded by big leafy trees. There are three other women on the other benches, aged in their late 20s to mid-30s, Two prams, five kids from three to nine playing on the swings and stuff, having a great time. And you're just sitting there, it's a beautiful afternoon, you're chilled out, watching the joy of the, of the kids playing, having a lovely time, maybe scrolling through a trash mag. An elderly man shuffles along the path towards the women in their prams, where a gorgeous two-year-old happily sits. Old mate leans down with a smile to touch the child on the head, happily reminded of his great-grandchild. Get away! screams one. Don't touch my child, you pedophile, yells another mother, calling for their kids and scrambling their things together to get away from this man. Old mate stands there, dazed and confused as to what has just happened. As the three women leave the park, the nine-year-old turns and screams, you're a pedophile. Now it turns out that old mate has just reached stage three dementia and had started wandering in the afternoons. He wasn't quite sure where he was, still had his dressing gown on, and didn't remember how he got there. Poppy was an awesome dad to his five kids, nine grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. But at 80, he'd become increasingly forgetful and disorientated. He stands there before you, upset and confused, a frail old man who needs an ARIO. What was your go-to choice? Many of us with older parents, more experienced with ageing humans, would have used compassion and kindness first, as they can relate to this sort of situation in their own families. A generational juxtaposition of learned behaviour is happening in our lives, between those raised before the internet and social media began and those raised with it. The obsession with self and the dissemination of information through social media channels sees us witnessing moments of self-righteous anger online with full-on slanging matches between people that don't even know each other, inciting others to get involved and to take sides, giving them permission to be judgmental and angry, causing a viral wave of negativity. Compassion is losing and it's being replaced by unempathetic suspicion, fear and judgment of others. We all have things, sometimes awful things that happen to us in our lives that shape our past and the people that, I mean, that are part of our past and shape the people that we are today, giving us our mindset towards certain issues and situations in life that we find ourselves in. A model of healing is not about forgetting at what's happened to you, but it's looking at, at but it, it's looking at what has happened and saying that it will never defeat me. Going through life looking backwards for guidance to who you were and what you did will not bring you healing. We must make a choice to not pass on our suffering but what we have learnt from it. Turn our woes into wisdom, into wisdom. Shakespeare's Hamlet says we create a paradise or hell in our own minds by how we choose to think. There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. By making it a habit to practice a new attitude of self-reflection, we can foster a new feeling or overcome an intense emotion like anger. When we choose not to have preconceived ideas like a bias or a point of view and exert our free will, we expand our options and it moves us towards a truer view of the world. Kindness, caring and a willingness to help others is a positive emotion that has to do with being thoughtful and decent. Compassion improves your health by strengthening your immune system, normalising your blood pressure, lowering your stress and depression, improving your physical recovery from illness and even extending your life. I know, right? Compassion is a natural instinct within us all, but it's stifled when we lack mindfulness. Compassion is the embodiment of the realisation that what benefits the authentic, 
well-being of others also benefits ourselves. We have reached a time in our collective consciousness where historical sex crimes are now being brought to light. Starting with the entertainment industry in Australia, the UK and America, since 2014, we have all been following aghast as some of our favourite children's entertainers, like Rolf Harris and Bill Cosby, among others, have been accused and found guilty of terrible crimes. Living lives of superstardom and riches and placed in high regard in society, we invited these men into our homes via their G-rated TV shows and watched them on TV as kids. We shared them with our families as we got older. We trusted them. We loved them. In 2014, I had a choice to make, one that could impact my life significantly. It was a will I, won't I situation. I was at home one night and watching a woman being interviewed on TV about taking Rolf Harris to court for, being, uh, for molesting her when she was a little girl. It was huge news and, and had also hit all the papers, both here and in the UK. I knew that I had information that could support her case as I too had been molested by him whilst working as a television makeup artist in 1986 at Channel 7 Studios in Sydney. Millions of fans around the world were outraged and in total disbelief that Rolf Harris was guilty. They were upset and angry that England's national treasure, much-loved children's entertainer and artist, friend of the royal family and portrait painter of the Queen, was being accused of the sexual molestation of young girls. People were angry and self-righteous and in their, in their indignation full of blame towards the victims. So I had a big decision to make. I wanted to come forward to support this woman and back up her story. I felt compassion for her as she was being judged in the press and being bullied. How did I feel, though, about putting myself out there to be judged and ridiculed and have all sorts of horrible things said about me around the world? For a woman that I didn't even know, was I prepared to put myself and my family through that for justice? Would you? I made the choice and I decided to come forward. I had to write an email to the judge in England explaining how I felt should my name be given to the press. Was I still prepared to come forward? As we all know, change does not come from silence. And regardless of the consequences of my actions, I believe if those of us who knew the truth didn't come forward to support the other victims, it was like these women were being abused all over again. The judge chose me as a witness and granted us all lifetime anonymity taking the stand as a bad character witness in the trial of Rolf Harris in England, saw the nameless, faceless me portrayed in the press as the strongest witness for the prosecution. Found guilty on all 12 counts of sexual assault, he was sentenced to five years and nine months. Because of the bravery of his victims in coming forward, the world has discovered who he is at his core. Winning the case encouraged many other victims to come forward. This was at the beginning of a snowball effect that saw many victims of rich, powerful men in all sorts of walks of life um, step up in support of others to tell their stories of sexual assault, helping the process of healing in themselves and in others. This has come to be known as the Me Too movement. This is a positive time in society that is affecting real change for women around the world, educating and changing those with generational mindsets and behaviours and promoting workplace equality. Yes. For when we stand up for ourselves, we truly stand up for others. Today the world is in even more greater need of our compassion than ever before and our opportunities for expressing compassion are also greater than ever before in history because of social media. Compassion is contagious and spreads outwards, inspiring further acts of compassion and kindness when witnessed and experienced. Compassion increases the possibilities for peace and reconciliation where there is conflict. Now, here's a little exercise in self-realisation for you. You ready? I would like you to imagine being in my situation. Put yourself in my shoes. Have a think about it. There's no right or wrong, right? What would you have done? How far would you have gone? What action would you have taken? Where are your boundaries? Would you do it for friends, for families? Does that extend to like second cousins, workmates, 
What are you willing to do to sacrifice for truth and justice? How far would you go? Would you do it for a stranger or not at all? What's your next choice going to be? Thanks, guys. I'd love to hear if you uh, have any questions for me about anything to do with it. Please um, harp on because I know Brett's there. Oh, hi. <laughs> I can't hear you though, Brett. <laughs>